Welcome back to Disaster Communications, your go-to source for all things off-grid and disaster communication. Today, we're gonna to be doing a deep dive into the review of the Redivus HD2 radio, a robust and reliable device that could be a game changer in your emergency communication kit. Whether you're prepping for a natural disaster or just need a durable radio for outdoor adventures, whatever, the HD2 has some standout features that make it top contender. All right, forgive me for interrupting this video. I I was I already had everything done, recorded, and then I started seeing a lot of comments. I posted a picture on my Instagram channel about the, doing the review of the HD2, and uh, one of the top comments was, hey, does this still have the signal noise? Does it still have the spurry submissions? Does it have the harmonics? Is it still dirty? And uh, so I, that led me down this rabbit trail of uh, checking out other reviews and videos and seeing some of the early on models the people having issues with it having a bad spurry submission. It's a fancy word for when you key up, you know, the harmonics or the uh, sister frequencies. But uh, basically when you key up, you, you want as less of those side harmonics going out. Think of it like this. When I throw a rock in a puddle of water and you get those several rings, essentially that's what we're doing. We're transmitting the first harmonic is the first wave. That's the one that you want to go out. But because of the way the atmosphere and everything works and the fundamentals of RF and the wavelengths and the frequencies, you get these little continued ripples. Well, you don't want those other ripples as large. They have to be contained and controlled. So what radio manufacturers do is they, they some of the higher end radios, they go and they eliminate pretty much all of that. They try to get as that as low as possible, no fundamental, no extra ripples, let's call it that. And so I guess early on on these uh, HD2s, a lot of people were having, they were doing the measurements. So the way the FCC does that, that's the Federal Communication Commissions, they have a rule that says uh, no more, those, those other ripples can't be at least 40 dB or higher. So, and when you read those numbers, like negative 20 is higher than negative 40. So just, you know, think of it backwards in your head. So I, I like many people went out, I bought me a little, a tiny SA signal analyzer, a uh, little cheap thing off of Amazon. Uh, an oscilloscope is an official way to do it. You know, they have really high-end units. And uh, so I thought I would do the test myself. I kind of watched how other people were doing it. And I wanted to know for myself, you know, what, what was going on here. And uh, I, one of the videos pointed out that they couldn't find the FCC ID number on, online. They were kind of hinting to maybe that being a, a false ID number or something. I've seen another commenter say, well, sometimes they can have that FCC ID number, but it takes time for it to show up in the database. So I did my due diligence, did some research, found that they had had four or five uh, applications, I guess is the right way, or submissions for that ID number. And uh, those all show different frequencies. Like one of the reviewers said, why does it show on a 2.7? That, you know, it's, this is a VHF UHF not a, you know, 2.7 gigahertz. And um, well, the, the radio has Bluetooth in it. So Bluetooth for your headset to your, so that they have to even test the Bluetooth. So I went in and started looking at some of the, the testing and I seen pictures where they actually have these radios set in a uh, an RF uh, silent room, for example. And, and uh, they have special high-end test equipment not not what I got, you know, like a less than a hundred dollars on Amazon, and, uh, and and let me even just throw this out: uh, Tiny SA is really uh, uh, they're very vocal about. There's clone versions of these, so you can even get clones of the testing equipment, trying to test a clone of radios, possibly, you know. So so just to say that even this is not as accurate as I would. You know, like I wouldn't be doing any FCC type acceptance testings on something like this compared to, you know, say the several thousand dollar signal analyzer in a controlled environment, you know, not using like the little bitty attenuators like I'm using, like a 40 dB just in line. Uh, they actually have special ones that have taps on them and, and better weight. So I say all that to say, let's jump into, I want to show you my results and uh, show you what I came up with. And then just answer the question, do I feel like it's, uh, legal is it safe you know is it is it okay to use then also i want to talk a little bit about what i did in comparison with some other radios so let's jump in i want to show you this results 
Okay, so um, I've seen a lot of comments. This is the test, and people are asking if uh, if the uh, HD2 still is sending out spurry submissions. So this is a test. I'm just using a tiny SA, so it's not uh, you know the highest of quality of scientific, but uh, it's pretty consensus that it is close. 40 dB attenuator. I'm on 146.52. So what I'm going to do is key up. Let it run its little test. And give it a couple times to let it settle in. So technically, it's supposed to be negative 40 below. Here's the first, and here's the second, so it's the second supposed to be 40 dB, so it's really close. So it came out just under the 40 dB, so it's really close. And um, so if I'm going off of this, I would say it's not legal, but common sense in my mind is just telling me, okay, well, it's got FCC type acceptance, so and would they have sent you know one special unit to be tested or or whatever? I don't think so. I don't think that's accurate. So um, I'm going to say with with all these, there's going to be a variable of error, you know, chance of error. So in my mind, uh, in opinion, is is this one's safe? It's legal. It's not, it's not going to cause you any problems. Where it would cause problems, and the reason the FCC is so important about keeping those spurious wavelengths out and down is uh, those ripples, they'll travel up frequencies as they go out from the fundamental. So from the initial rock drop on out, those uh, frequencies go up and, and down likewise. And could even get into like, let's say, uh, some of the police radio frequencies and interfere there. But uh, that's why they require it to be a certain level, you know, 40 dB in this case, below the, the fundamental. Because they've determined that, you know, that it won't interfere. Now I can tell you, if you take two radios side by side and you key up one, you're gonna hear it because of the proximity effect. Now, if I was gonna take this HT and, and put it on an outside antenna, you know, with a, a 100 watt linear, I may not be, you know, that may not be favorable, but in my opinion, I believe it is safe to use. I do have the latest firmware on there. I did double check that to make sure I'm using the most current to see if maybe that was part of it. Now. I did throw on my Yaesu FT5, and let me just say, you know, there's a trade-off when you buy these the Chinese-made radio versus a, a Japanese-made radio. Uh, Japanese was Yaesu, Kenwood, and ICOM. Those have been the fundamentals. Those have been the main players in radio for a long time. And then uh, the Chinese came out here with uh, the bail things. They brought those out. Uh, several other, you know, clones even, like let's say Anytone, uh, B-Tech, and uh, some of these other, just washing, and there's a whole bunch of them out there. So uh, what happened though is, is you know, they're, they're cheaper to buy. So yeah, it's great for end users. And uh, one of the trade-offs is that quality of construction. And uh, is, does that keep me from wanting to use this radio? Absolutely not. It's, it's still a great radio. Now I'm, I'm gonna say this again, I'm very big about every, a radio must have a serve a purpose. So I've got a lot of different radios. I've got my Yaesu, I've got my Linkos, I've got my Kenwoods, HTs, I've got, I've got Anytones, I've got some BTEC, you know, I've got these uh, Redivis. And, and uh, for me, the radio serves a purpose. Uh, a lot of people say, what, what radio should I buy? That, and it's hard to answer that because, you know, if you're, if you're doing like outdoor service work or Maybe you're in an emergency communication group. Maybe you're responding like Aries or Amateur Radio Emergency Service, or you're part of Civil Defense or something like that. You're out there in the field, and you're, it's storming and stuff like that. Well, I don't want to take a four or five hundred dollar Kenwood out there when I could take this Radivus HD2 that's waterproof, water resistant, and uh, not only that, but the you know the side where the the speaker mic screws in, it actually threads in versus. A lot of the others just push in. They come out pretty easy. So, if you're out, you're in the ground, you're rolling around, you're you know you're crawling or doing stuff like that. You're maybe you're into tactical communications. I, I'm not opposed to the HD2 going out there like that. Versus my high-end radio, I'm going to keep it 
a little more protected. So if you're looking for something that's tough, durable, water resistant, waterproof, IP67 dust proof and all the, all the bells and whistles there. Now it doesn't have like the APRS feature, it does have the DMR, it's a DMR. You can talk back in text with it. Uh, it does do encryption, but it doesn't have the APRS full blown like the, let's say like the Anytone or the BTEC does. So, so there's, I can't say there's one radio you need to buy. So I'm a fan of something like this for definitely outdoor communication, tough and durable, nothing wrong with it to, to use like that. As far as the Tesco, uh, maybe they've improved it on the you know current firmware. And I would suspect that, uh, I don't know if this is a firmware feature that they can clean up. There may be some things in firmware, but usually you're filtering like this. Um, is done like you you have your if filter which is the uh, receive type filter and a lot of that filtering is done with physical components so i don't know if we're ever going to see it get much better uh, i may be wrong there may be some of that that they can fix in the firmware let's say sdr type you know software defined type radios but um i think it's probably going to be where we sit but the fcc says it's good uh it's so close to mine to being at that 40 db level that I thought the test that I did myself, I feel comfortable using it and, and recommending it. So anyways, for those of you that don't know anything about the radio, let's jump back into it and uh, check out the rest of my review. Thank you guys. Hey, I want to thank everybody on my, my Instagram channel and TikTok for reaching out to me. If you don't follow me there, look up for me on Instagram, TikTok. It's all disaster communications. But if they wouldn't have reached out and asked those questions, I wouldn't even done this deep dive and looked at all this. So I appreciate that. You know, it's my, my slogans, get information, give information. So several of you gave those questions. Hey, is, you know, there's, there may be an issue with it. So what I've done even since then is, is still using the same little testing unit, uh, the tiny SA. I went and checked some of the other radios and stuff like that. And I will say some of the other Redivus radios that I've tested here, uh, they passed no problem at all. They were well below that. So uh, that, that threshold. So just to give you a heads up, I, I'm really glad I did that. This is something I've never really done a lot in ham radio. I've never taken, never owned a OS oscilloscope. We call them oscilloscopes. And uh, so buying this little essay kind of helped uh, broaden that knowledge base a little bit. And and it's good for us to know. A lot of times we trust our manufacturers to to give us that. But uh, just knowing that there is a lot of clones in the in the Chinese radio market. So it's good to kind of double check that and be safe and make sure we're not out there causing harmful interferences is the way the FCC calls it. So thank you all. And uh, let's jump back into that review. Let's start with what sets the Redivus HD2 apart from the competition. First of all, it's got IP67 waterproof rating. It's kind of a new thing for a lot of radio devices. I've not seen this too much. The Redivus HD2 is designed to withstand the elements. It's IP67 rating simply means it's not just splash proof, but fully waterproof. You can submerge this radio in up to like uh, one meter of water for 30 minutes and it will still come out functioning perfectly. This feature is crucial in disaster scenarios where water exposure is a real threat. Think like heavy rain, floods, even when you're caught in a downpour during an off-grid expedition. The second feature is it's a dual band operation, VHF, UHF. The HD2 operates on both VHF and UHF frequencies, providing you with the flexibility in various communication scenarios. Whether you're trying to reach someone in a dense urban environment or across open terrain, the HD2 gives you that ability to switch bands and to maximize your range and clarity. Third thing I like about it is the large display and easy navigation. In an emergency, time is the, uh, the essence. The red of its HD2 large color display is easy to read and even in low light conditions. The user-friendly interface allows for quick access to important features like changing frequencies, adjusting power output, or even scanning channels. I do like how you can even program it from the keypad. You don't have to have the computer. We'll get into that on a second video when we do a deep dive into the program. Another feature I like is the long battery life. Power is often a scarce resource in disaster situations. 
but the Revitus HD2 comes equipped with a high capacity battery that ensures long operational hours. Whether you're coordinating with a response team or monitoring emergency channels, this radio is built to last when you need it most. Not only that, but it allows for USB-C charging capabilities. That's a feature I wish all radios manufacturers would start implementing, USB-C charging. You can use solar panels to charge it and uh, go directly into it. The fifth thing I like about it is durability and build quality. Alongside its waterproofing, the HD2 is built to withstand drops, shocks, and general rough handling. Its rugged construction ensures that it can endure the physical demands of disaster zones or rugged outdoor environments. Let's talk about the pros and cons of the Redivus HD2. Some of the pros, waterproofing. The IP67 rating is significant plus, especially in wet or flood prone areas. The versatility, dual band operation allows for versatile communications, whether it's DMR or FM analog. It's got durable construction, built to last in harsh conditions. This radio won't let you down. The user interface is really friendly. The large color display Intuitive controls make it easy to operate even under stress. My last pro is the battery life. Long-lasting power is a critical advantage in any off-grid emergency situation. And let's talk about a couple of the cons. The size and weight. The HD2 is a bit bulkier than some of the other radios in the market, which might be a consideration if you need to go pack light or something. The only other con that I've seen offhand was the software interface. It's a lot different than any programming code plug software interface that you ever used. But to back that up, I will say another pro on it is that I can program everything minus the zone. So far, that's the only thing I've discovered I haven't been able to program from the user interface is the zones. But everything else, if I'm in the field and I need to add a talk group readily available, I could add it and still use it in the field. So most other DMR radios you're using the computer or something like that to update it. So I, I'm, that's kind of growing on me, I'm gonna admit, I, I do like that feature. So is the Redivus HD2 worth it? If you need a reliable, rugged, and waterproof radio for disaster communications or off-grid use, the answer is resoundingly yes. Its robust feature set uh, combined with its durability makes it an excellent choice for anyone serious about preparedness. If you like this video, do me a favor, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you don't miss out any of the upcoming content on off-grid and disaster communication solutions. Stay safe, be prepared, and keep communication. And like I always say, get information, give information. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Disaster Communications.